I mean, it's part of the anarchist philosophy. If, if people are starving, you don't write a letter to your congressman. The, the idea of direct action is that if people don't have enough food, you take it. Welcome to The New Architects. This is your host, Jason Bayless. Tonight, we're, we're going to talk about food empowerment and what it means. Joining us in the discussion is Lauren, the founder of Food Empowerment Project. Welcome to The New Architects, Lauren. Thanks for having me on. Before we jump into our conversation, I want to get the website out to the people. The Food Empowerment Project website is foodispower.org. So how are you doing tonight? All right. How are things out east? It's, it's, it's going good. It's going well. <laughs> I want I, before we jump into this. I, I have to I have to tell this story because this is the mom, This is a moment that I remember when we first met. I was fol- following elephants around the country, <laughs> and this is one of the moments that defined um, our, our meeting. We were walking across a field. I think we were either going to or coming from getting a Dr. Pepper. I, I, I can't remember which direction we were going, but um, anyway, we were we were crossing the field and jumping over a creek that was in the middle of the field, talking about our fascination with a certain Cuban dictator. And as we were talking about this, you pulled out a photo of Fidel Castro. <laughs> and I think that moment right there and that conversation kind of sealed our moment as friends. <laughs> That and the Dr. Pepper. And the Dr. Pepper. Yes. <laughs> so, I have it. That's 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 how our our friendship has been. You know, <laughs> walking through fields, <laughs> drinking Dr. Pepper, and talking about Cuba. Exactly. But anyway, back then, if I remember correctly, you just started, or it was in the very young stages of the Food Empowerment Project. So why don't you give it, take a moment and tell us what this is, what the Food Empowerment Project is. Sure. We're still a very tiny organization. We're an all-volunteer group at this point. And basically what we're trying to do is help people recognize the power of their food choices, that a lot of people that I know and you know in the activist realm are vegans, which, we, which Food Empowerment Project sees as one step in a more just world in terms of our diet and our food choices. Um, but for Food Empowerment Project, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond where our, how, how our food is being raised and how the people who are raising and harvesting, so to speak, our food are being treated. So as a vegan organization, we're promoting more consumption of fruits and vegetables. So we feel very strongly that we need to make sure that the farm workers in the fields are treated with dignity and respect. Um, we also go beyond that to talk about other food justice issues, such as water privatization, union busting done by corporations, as well as the chocolate slavery issue and what's happening in Africa. And then we also tag on with food justice as well, access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities. We see this as a grave injustice and, in fact, a form of food apartheid, where certain people are denied access to healthy foods. So we work to combat that. You talk about the importance of um, getting food to low-income families and people of color. But I think the common question when people hear that would be, you know, don't they have access to the same foods as you and me? I mean, can't they go, they go to the same stores, don't they? I mean, I don't understand. I guess explain why this is an important element to, you know, pro- providing people healthy food. Right. I think that there's this common misconception when you hear things like the high obesity rates and diabetes rates in communities of color and low-income communities that somehow these people don't want to eat healthy or they don't know how to eat healthy. And what it really comes down to is the access issue. Um, when we did, we surveyed here in Santa Clara County, which is where we're based, um, the difference between high-income areas and low-income areas on grocery stores. Um, we went out and we surveyed what the types of grocery stores that were in the high-income communities and then what types of similar places were in the lower-income communities. And it's not only is a type of food different that they're able to access, it's also different in terms of where they're getting their food. So a lot of the chains, you don't find them in these communities. What you find are liquor stores as well as convenience stores, which quite frankly are liquor stores masquerading as food markets. So the types of foods in these places, um, there's 
pretty much little to no fresh produce whatsoever. Um, and even that that's there isn't necessarily priced. So if you have a language barrier or maybe you're obviously very concerned about funds, you're going to maybe not ask the cost of produce because of the concerns that it's very high. Um, you also have, you know, I mean, most of the, the lemons that we even found in the liquor stores were just next to the beer. You know, it's a different different type of system that's being pushed in these communities where you have more junk food, more soda, and definitely more alcohol um, than when you go into the higher income communities where you have well-lit stores and all the food is obviously marked. Yeah. So why do, why do you think it is, it is pushed this way? I mean, on... And how can people, what can people do in their own community to change it? Because I'm sure it's not this, not just in your area this is happening. This has happened nationwide. It is happening. It's happening all over the country. And I think that most people, when you bring this up to somebody, and I give a lot of talks on it, they don't realize it until somebody points it out that in certain communities there just aren't as many grocery stores. Now, why this is happening um, a lot of the big chains left these lower-income communities. They felt like it, they could make more money in higher-income areas, so they left. Um, you know, for our organization, we haven't done a lot of research into when this started or how long or why it's going on. We're really – our point now has been really trying to find out what it is that's happening and how can we stop it. Um, it's a harder issue, just like when we talk about, you know, people trying to eat produce that is where the workers are treated decently. It's not as easy. None of these issues are as easy as go vegan. You want to stop suffering of animals, just don't eat them. It's more difficult than that. One of the things that we try and do with this part, this access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities, create awareness about it. Um, talk about it. When you see articles in newspapers talking about the fact of high rates of diabetes and obesity in communities of color, make sure that what's not left off is the fact that access is a huge issue and it's a big problem. You, uh, you have a study on your website, foodispower.org, um, this study that you, you were talking about, and you have a chart have on a there chart. about the percent of locations with produce in lower income areas and higher income areas. <laughs> Just non non organic fresh fruits is in the low low income area is seventeen point three percent, and in the higher incomes is thirty three point seven percent. In organic produce is pretty much non existent yeah, in the lower income an, areas. On the chart, it says it's point one percent of organic produce or fruits and vegetables um, in the lower income versus the eight point three percent. And this, this survey was done a couple years back. Before, before, I, I would take it before the, the boom of the organic um, push from stores like Kroger and all the other supermarkets now having an organic health section. This was conducted last year. Oh, was it last year? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we, we just released it um, this year. But the actual surveying done by our volunteers was done um, some of this year and last year. Um, one of the interesting th things that we found out from our survey was not only, again, the price, the, the, the problem that in these communities, these convenience stores aren't putting prices on the produce, but we also found out that the federal coding system on how they track um, grocery stores is not accurate. So in the report, you can see a bar graph that shows, you know, if you just go by the census tracking code, it looks like there's the same amount as um, grocery stores in the lower income areas as there are in the higher income areas. But after actually going through and doing the surveying and determining that these so-called grocery stores are just little convenience stores, it's more of a drastic difference. Yeah. And this is a, you know, this is this means that any type of federal government body agency, anybody going in, looks and says, oh, they, they're proportionate. They, you know, they have the same amount, but it's not the same. You cannot compare a Safeway or a Whole Foods market to a mom-and-pop market. They're not the same. You know, again, these places not only didn't have much, if any, produce whatsoever, the canned items, many were expired, um, and the foods weren't really of any good quality. Wow. And for anybody listening, we will put this um, a link to this report on the New Architects so you can check it out because it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, once you, like you said, once you, once somebody mentions it and you actually see it in front of you, you're kind of like, holy crap, that <laughs> is actually happening. Um, 
So what can people do in their communities to help improve? Because I, I know corporations off, right off the bat are not going to move back in to lower income families or in, in, to lower income communities. And they're not going to start producing more produce and more healthier foods in these areas. So what can individuals do to help well, increase increase the, he- the healthy food? I mean, we Food Empowerment Project follows the environmental justice principles. So for these communities, we're going to be going back into those communities and find out what they want. Um, we feel there's been a disservice in a sense where, you know, whoever decides, whether it be a city or an NGO, goes in and says, ah, we should put a farmer's market here without any input from the community members. So our goal is to actually go out and find out what the community members want. What we would love, of course, is for people to get off the system, grow their own food, but we know that that's not practical for everyone, um, so we need to figure out other solutions. Very nice. Very nice. So other um, issues that you focus on that you mentioned, you know, this one is, is hi- highly important, but I think all of all the issues that you have listed out on um, foodispower.org are pretty much is equal, is important, because you, you go from land animals to ocean, ocean animals to workers, human slavery, environment, food choices, food justice, and food and health and global issues. Um, you want to take a moment and we just kind of give an overview of each, each um, sure. I guess, bullet point? Like yeah. for land animals, why is it important um, for the Food Empowerment Project and for you know communities to know about the land animal issues? Well, our organization really wants to fight injustice and we feel that the best way that our organization is focused into is with food. Everything we do revolves around food because people do it several times a day, and food is a choice that we all have, and we can vote for oppression or we can vote against oppression. And what's taking place against animals right now on factory farms, and frankly any farm, is appalling. Um, I don't know if I need to go through every single animal, but for us it's important that we strive to remove different forms of oppression from our lives and going vegan and not consuming animal products is one of the easiest things we can do to immediately save lives and not be a part of a system that perpetuates that animals are mere commodities and not feeling beings. And that by being vegan also helps the other bullet points that you're talking about in terms of global issues and um, environment issues. To some extent, yeah. I mean, definitely, um, you know, we're corporations from the United States are doing what I call exporting factory farms, which is basically perpetuating this disgusting, greedy system um, that they've created here in the United States, which not, not only kills animals by the millions, but it also pollutes communities and degrades our environment. Um, and they're perpetuating this now overseas, abroad, and this is exactly what they're giving to other countries now, is our pollution yeah. and our disgusting way of, of viewing animals. Um, so it is in that regard. When we talk about workers, though, again, it's being vegan isn't enough. Um, when you look at the fact that farm workers who pick our produce um, are treated illegally, basically, in this country. This isn't something where we can point at another country and say, oh, aren't they bad, aren't they horrible. This is what the United States is doing. These are people who are not being paid a living wage. They're not even being paid minimum wage. They have no insurance, no protections. Um, They work long hours, 14 hours a day, and um, are actually dying right now in the fields because of the heat. Well, maybe not this exact moment, but during the summer times, many workers in California die of, because of heat exhaustion. Just this year in the state of California, a, a bill was introduced that would pay farm workers overtime. It was vetoed. Mm. 2010, we couldn't get a law passed in the state of California to pay these workers for overtime. What other job do we allow that to happen? Where This is such a, a critical part of the system of our economy in this country, and yet we treat the workers like that. So, you know, the veganism is like a big part of it. And then the secondary issues are these other ones where we feel like people need to, you know, find out what's happening with the farm workers. Vegan or not, it doesn't matter. Everybody eats the food that these farm workers produce, yeah. and we need to make sure they're treated well. There was on your site, um, talking about the workers, there was something that really blew my mind because 
like as you said, you this is happening here in the United States. You can't point your finger at anybody else, and the fact that um, on your site you point out that the slave labor still exists, that yeah. um, in such forms as forced labor and debt bondage. Yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit because that's just, it blows my mind. Sure, and this is happening. You know what I'll talk about right now, specifically the United States, when workers travel from other countries, whether it be, you know, South America or Asia, they're they're being told they're going to get good work in this country. And they come over what they believe is legally coming over, and they're getting a contract. Um, basically, it's a contractor. These corporations hire contractors. And, again, we're talking about not just farmed animal products. We're also talking about produce. Um, so the workers come in and they think they have a really great contract and they're told to hand over their passports and they give their passports up and they work for, maybe they signed a contract to work somewhere for a year or three years. And when they get there, they work for a few months, maybe three to six months. And then they're told by the contractor, oh, we've changed. We don't need you working over here. We're going to have you work in a different field. The minute they do that, they violate their contract, so then they're there undocumented. But they're not going to turn around and leave because most of these people have put all of their life savings into coming here to work and send the money back home and, and hope for a better life for themselves and their families. This totally paints so, a different... Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, so they're, they're not able to leave. They're not able to do anything. These workers are sometimes working in very desolate areas. Again, the idea that they can complain about the working conditions. There have been workers who have been found chained in 18-wheelers, um, workers who are just left, no, you know, locked inside, basically, and this is how they're treated, and they're, they're too scared to speak up. Now, more and more of those great organizations out there representing workers, but for the most part, workers don't know their rights. They don't, even if they did, not all of them are going to feel like they have, know the language enough to defend themselves. This paints a completely different picture than what Fox News talks about, um, people coming over taking our jobs. Oh, right. <laughs> this is insane that – I mean, it's like how can they – I guess because they're, they're not – these the workers that come over are not really known by any agency because – how can they have their passports taken away from them and – become undocumented how is how is our government and how are the people allowing this to happen well i think it's just you know there's a there's a nice way of looking at it and just saying they're overwhelmed there's not enough of them to go out and inspect and then there's the reality that corporations tend to run this country and we take a blind you know we give them a blind eye whenever these corporations to do such things when you have children working in slaughterhouses mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's what Upton St. Clair's book, The Jungle, it's still happening. You know, and yet we know this stuff continues. And do we say that it's because we're it's a burden system? Um, or do we acknowledge the fact that we let these corporations do it and we do nothing to stop them? It's, I don't know, it, it blows my mind when I was reading the reports on your website about it, especially even, even corporations that support mm -hmm. You know that create chocolate. You know Nestle and uh, Mars bars and Hershey's. That would su that would deliberately support the s slave industry and the chocolate industry in other countries. Um, yeah. And like West Africa. I mean, right. some of the yeah. some of the stories you have on the site are are insane. That that we allow corporations to do this. Exactly, and what's so frightening is is that. We have to remind ourselves that chocolate is a luxury. There's no necessity about chocolate. There's no USDA pyramid telling us how much chocolate we need to eat. <laughs> There's nobody pushing chocolate except for these corporations. And these corporations are, in fact, the reason why this is taking place. Um, again, I got interested in the issue about eight years ago because of an interview they did with one of the workers who had escaped you know, here they had workers who were locked in at night and they were beaten um, if they tried to leave. These are the workers picking the cacao beans or the cocoa beans. And the worker basically said something to the effect that, you know, he was asked, what would you say to Westerners who 
um, eat chocolate. And he said, every time you bite into chocolate, you're biting into my flesh. And I mm-hmm. thought, that's the same thing an animal would say. There's absolutely no difference yeah. in terms of the way the suffering of human beings and the suffering of animals. If, you know, if you get that, you know, for, for either side, someone who's vegan who doesn't get the animals and someone who's a human rights activist who doesn't get, you know, veganism, it's, like, it's all the same thing. And so, you know, we, we feel quite strongly that this is an issue that we as an organization want to speak out about. And I had been for years talking about encouraging people just to eat chocolate that was organic or fair trade, then come to find out when we're writing this portion of our website that they're finding um, child labor in these fair trade fields. Now, to the credit to these organizations who are doing this type of accreditation, they're taking the children out and the children are being placed in schools or back with their families. But as an organization like ours, there's no way we can encourage anybody to feel safe about that. There's no way we can say just eat organic or fair trade any longer. We now say not to eat chocolate that comes from Africa and buy only organic and fair trade chocolate, but to make sure it does not come from Africa. And chocolate just from Africa or is there chocolate from other other nations or it just mainly Mainly reports or from West Africa? All the reports we've heard are from the Ivory Coast in Ghana. Okay. Now, that's not to say that it's not happening anywhere else, but it, we would have to pretty much tell everybody not to eat everything, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> because we don't know about absolutely everything. But we are, you know, we, we did um, contact film producers and journalists who've worked on this issue um, to see if they knew of anything happening anywhere else, and they didn't. So as of this moment, we only know of it taking place in um, those two countries in Africa. But all the major chocolate company producers, Nestle, Hershey's, um, are getting their chocolate from West Africa. Correct. So the best thing to do is if if you're in doubt and you don't know if your chocolate's from West West Africa, don't buy from those companies. Yeah, we're actually putting together a list of um, companies that are vegan or vegan-friendly and indicating um, which ones – where they're getting their chocolate from, and that should be on our website, hopefully in the next couple months, and more than likely we're going to be targeting a company that many people like who like vegan products um, because they're not being transparent about their supply chain. Yeah. yeah. That is insane. You mentioned fair mentioned trade fair. and how it's hard to support um, companies that are that yep. are going in to, to West Africa to pull these kids out and stuff, but... I guess a lot of people don't understand what, I guess, the basic concept of fair trade is. You want to explain that, and then we'll go into it. Yeah, basically, the fair trade organizations that go out, they try and make sure that the workers are being paid a living wage. And um, living wages, there's a lot, depending on what country you're in, there's a certain criteria that goes along with that. Um, but they, a lot of them work with cooperatives, and again, cooperatives are where you know everybody owns a part of the company, so that they make their own decisions on production and how much people are being paid and things like that. So fair trade is really supposed to be really giving the workers um, a livable wage. It, it. So how do people know that when they buy something that says fair trade on it, that it's actually being? held to the standard and not just a company throwing it on there saying that, you know, kind of like what they do with humane eggs or, you know, the the beef chain um, that absolutely means nothing. They just do it to help sell products. No, it's a good point. I, you know, I, I don't know, honestly. I mean, we do let people know that just because something's organic, you know, organic apples or anything doesn't necessarily mean the workers are treated any better, just like animals. Um, But, in terms of knowing if the fair trade um, certification is working, I don't know. I I believe, at least in the organizations that are doing it, um, which one of which is Global Exchange. Right. But you're working on that list, and we'll have some something in the next couple of months about that. Yes. And you have a newsletter called The Food Chain. What is that? Basically what it is, is this is something we've created for people who have just gone vegan. So people who have been vegan or vegetarian for a long time probably won't be interested in it. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to show all these food justice issues as one. So basically people will get an issue a month for a year, and every issue contains a different animal story. 
and also different social justice issues. So that way people who are interested in going vegan because they care about animals will always get that animal story. But let's say they start getting weak about being vegan, but then they learn something in the next issue about a social justice issue or environmental issue or health issue. And every issue has a farmed animal story, a rescue story about an animal, um, again, environmental labor issues, recipes, uh, nutrition questions and answers, and support questions and answers, and just recommendations on where people can shop. So we're really, you know, we know a lot of people go vegan when they're handed a leaflet, and they may stick with it for a little while, but we've created food chains so that people get this at least one issue for a whole year to help them stick with it so they don't just get the flyer and then forget about why they decided to make that commitment. Well, why is it important um, for people to understand all of these issues and not just be vegan and not just be a human rights activist? Why is it important to embrace and encompass all of these movements? Because they're the same, I guess. To me, all these issues are the same. We're we're talking about systems um, that care nothing about life, that care nothing about protecting the environment. They don't care about people. They don't care about animals, and they're all part of the same bad thread. And although we can't always shop our way out of every single problem that there is, we can at least make some choices on our own, and we can also let our voice be heard in terms of what we do believe in and what we don't believe. As an activist, I've seen many times just by, you know, speaking out to corporations that we can have them make changes. Some will listen, you know, and if they're worried more about their bottom line, I'm not so sure, but their reputation is probably something they do care about. And so by looking at all these issues as one, we're more holistic. We're not you know, I think it's at least someone like me, it's too hard to be single-issued. It's just too difficult. You know, and every time in our lives we do have to make choices about what is or what isn't more important. I know that I struggle at the grocery store between only finding organic and local food and then sometimes leaving without buying any produce at all, which probably isn't very smart either. But this way, that the more informed we are, the more wise decisions we can make and the more impact we can hopefully have on the world around us. And, and that's really important, um, especially the comment you made about talking to, talking to corporations and letting them know no, that you're not, not happy with their practices and what they need to what they do need to improve to do. their practices. I mean, you have, you have great experience stories about working with corporations to to improve certain situations. I mean, you, even in your bio, you, um, it talks about how you've worked with Pier 1s, Trader Joe's, and Whole Foods Market. Market to make um, corporate changes within within those, within those you know, companies. companies. You want to talk and kind of give people yeah. kind of inspiration of how they should actually, if they're going to write a corporation, what are the key points that you should say or, you know, how to form that? Absolutely. I think that, you know, we're talking about things at a local level as well as, a, as a, at a larger level, but I think that we, any activist who... You know, I mean, I think there's different type of activists, and every single person who's, who speaks out on any issue, in my opinion, is an activist. And if you go to the grocery store and you find that, you know, none of the chocolate bars are fair trade or organic or they don't sell any that aren't from Africa, even just letting the store manager know that that's something that you want. Um, and, again, a lot of these people just don't know. Most people don't know about the chocolate industry. So even just by informing the manager, of, you know, giving him a list or letting him know about the issue, I guarantee you that they are going to listen to you. Um, and if they don't listen to you, that's when you let other people, your friends and family, know that, you know, please write or call the store and let them know. But any time you contact a company, I strongly suggest you just always assume they don't know. These people are juggling so many other things and unfortunately it's usually the ethical ones that don't float to the top so we need to be the ones to be patient and understanding let them know about the issue give them time to sit on it for a while but then follow up the biggest problem i think is that people don't follow up and so companies feel like they're off the hook if they answer somebody and don't give them a good answer this way you know you consistently oh i haven't heard back from you it's been two weeks okay what did you decide on this to not let it go because, again, you you may be speaking out for so many people other than yourself. There may be other people who are looking for something, 
some other type of chocolate that isn't Hershey or Mars, and they aren't willing to speak up. But the fact that you're speaking up will make a difference. And you also never know about the person you might speak to who might open their mind to these issues and talk to other people about it. And comment cards are very important as well. Anytime you have... Yeah, they still have those, yeah. (laughs) It was funny because when I was looking at your site a a while back, um, it it mentioned the comment cards in there. I was like, do places still have that? So when I I went out and about, and I was just out doing my daily routine stuff, I I looked at places to see if they still had them. They are, they still have them, but they're they're kind of hidden. They're usually by the, the, um, uh, like in grocery stores, I forget that, the place where you like the section of the grocery store where you go get money orders, customer or, service, yeah, customer yeah. service area. That, that's normally where it's at, but it's usually pushed far back. <laughs> they, they still have them, most of them that I've seen. So. Good, yeah, we do recommend that. I know that a couple of them do, and I was like, gosh, does everybody have that? But I mean, email obviously, and the thing with email is that that's something that they can ignore. But again, if you're consistent with them and you save the email and you forward to them and say. I emailed you two weeks ago. I haven't heard back from you. And just don't let it go. I mean, that's what being a campaigner on any issue about is the consistency yeah. and following up and them not believing that any answer they give you. And anybody's welcome to email us as well and let us know what the response they got from the company was. And we'd be happy to give them some input on maybe how to handle it. Very nice. Very nice. You also have on the website the Food Empowerment Project's Top 10 eating tips um we've we've touched on a lot of these like number one is go vegan um two is to shop with care you know boycott and don't buy from the chocolate companies coca-cola procter and gamble um choose organic we've mentioned it but we haven't really talked about why it's important to to eat organic well for food empowerment project i mean i'm obviously there's a lot of studies that show that Eating organic is better than, obviously, consuming produce that contains agricultural chemicals. Um, The Environmental Working Group has some information about this. For our organization, obviously, we want people to eat healthy and be healthy, but we also are are bigger concern is the workers. And although organic doesn't mean that the workers have great working conditions or living conditions, at least it's one less bad thing that the workers are exposed to. Yeah. Workers um, from, from what's called pesticide drift, um, which takes place on farms, um, say they spray a farm or a field, I should say, and um, if there's a school nearby, a lot of times the drift is going off those fields near where these school kids are. And, again, these are usually the kids of the farm workers. Um, but also just the spraying, these farm workers are exposed to these chemicals, which ca- are carcinogens and cause birth defects, and they cause, you know, high rates of cancer for these workers. I, I went to college in, in Austin, Texas, and worked with some, went to school with some um, children of farm workers, and one was would tell me about how her mom would come home with blisters all over her body from the agricultural chemicals. So, again, it's not a perfect situation to buy organic, but it's just one less bad thing. And if we can do anything to lessen some of the bad things that are happening to these workers, then we encourage people to do it. And we know organic can be expensive for people. So we just, even if you can only buy something organic once that time or two, two, you know, every two weeks try and buy organic, anything you can do will help because it sends a message. It sends a message to these agrochemical companies that consumers don't want that on their foods anymore. And maybe they'll only make the change because of consumers, but we want the change for the farm workers. Very nice. It's, I totally support everything that your group is doing. Um, Thank you. So one topic I want to want to go into that you mentioned on the issues is environmental, environmental. racism. What is environmental racism? Environmental racism is basically when one community is disproportionately impacted by a negative negative thing, whether it be, um, let's say, dumps or ports or um, even even like train stations or um, bus stations, where one community is disproportionately impacted. So it's primarily communities of color. Um, so for Food Empowerment Project, although we don't deal with a lot of the toxic issues that these communities deal with, we do look at factory farms. 
and the majority of factory farms are located in communities of color, where in places like North Carolina, which has, I don't know if it's the largest or the second largest pig-killing state in the nation, where you have residents there who can't even open their windows because of the flies. They have many respiratory problems because living so close to these factory farms and disproportionately high African-American neighborhoods. So it's, a, it's called environmental racism, and these are what we call environmental justice issues, where, you know, anybody in this country who likes to pretend that, you know, racism isn't still alive and well is kidding themselves. Um, and in terms of the food equity system, it's no different. It's blatant in terms of the factory farms. It's blatant in terms of the types of people who are working in slaughterhouses and factory farms. And most definitely, it is access to healthy foods and communities of color. It, it it's not there, and our communities are the ones who are more impacted um, by these types of dietary diseases. And so for Food Empowerment Project, we want to expose this. We, we don't want to pretend like these issues don't exist. They exist and they're real. It's, it's, it goes back to the report that we were talking about earlier about the, the not having the proper foods in these communities and the lower um, income. Not only are they not providing adequate food they're also not providing adequate living living environments the companies are pushing the stuff that most people don't want in their backyard into these lower incomes because i guess they feel that they don't have the money or anything to back up to fight them in the courts and try to get them out of their community but what's really important is people can can band together and and, and fight and, these and corporations, fight. similar to how what what communities have been doing um, against Walmart, um, Walmart moving into Walmart. their communities. They can do the same thing with factory farms and all these other corporations that are moving in trying to push their waste and filth onto their community. Yeah, and there have been movements in places like California. I'm not sure how much in the rest of the country, but to ban fast food. Um, because of the problem, um, because it's pretty obvious that they're locating in certain communities. Um, you know, something passed in San Francisco and Santa Clara County as well on, you know, some type of, and I don't know the specifics, but it's called like the Happy Meal ban, where basically if, you know, a Happy Meal or anything that's pushing themselves to children doesn't have a certain nutritional content, that it can't, it can't happen then. If, if they're going to be pushing products to kids, by putting free games or free toys, that there has to be a higher nutritional component for their foods. So there are some movements like that, and everybody should encourage those from passing and, and making sure that they do what they can, contact city council members or county board of supervisors to make sure that these types of laws pass. Um, the other problem with the access issue is that, you know, we have people who are trying to eat healthy who are traveling, you know, getting on public transportation, traveling two hours just to get fresh produce. I had a young woman when I spoke at a university about this. She came up and told me when she lived in Orange County, she um, would shop at Whole Foods all the time, and now that she moved out here and she doesn't have a car, she has to take a bus to another little town just to get organic produce. It's outrageous. And these, you know, families are doing this for each other. We're talking about people who it's been called um, – cash poor and they're time poor as well. We're talking about individuals who work maybe two or three jobs to make ends meet and the ability to take a public transportation, a bus, um, to, to go over and buy produce miles away, they don't have that kind of time. And also to carry a lot of groceries on your bike isn't exactly practical either. Yeah. So there's lots of barriers that are impacting people's ability to get access to healthy foods. And the Food Empowerment Project is going to help people get these food. <laughs> Our yes, we, we are going to talk to the communities and find out what we can do to help them get it. Absolutely. We're all volunteer right now, um, so we're counting on um, getting more students to help us out and other volunteers to make sure that we talk to the community members and find out, find out what they want. Awesome. So how can people listening to this program or who stumbled on your website help you out? I mean, I know you have you have a sign up and newsletter and stuff like that, but what can people physically do to either help out the food empowerment project or help out in their community by adopting what you're doing? 
they can contact us at info at foodispower.org and let us know what they're interested in helping with. Again, being an all-volunteer group right now, we have lots of writing tasks. We have lots of research. So we don't really have an office or anything. So all of our volunteers are scattered across the country. And, in fact, our translator is in Mexico City. So we need people to help with translation. We need people who are good at research. We need people who are good at writing. And if somebody really wants to take a look at if, their community is one of these communities that does not have access, we're happy to give our survey to them and have them do it. I mean, we want to make sure they do it right in terms of um, how wide of an area to be surveying, but we want to make sure that we created this tool um, for other groups to use as well. Oh, and people can also donate, obviously. <laughs> um, but signing up to our e-alerts is a really great way of being informed on what it is that we're doing um, when we put up new sections to the website, we also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account as well. Moving up on to the social networks. Yeah, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> I've got good volunteers. <laughs> now, their website is foodispower.org. I want everybody to go there, check it out, read the information, even if you're not going to get involved today or tomorrow. Definitely educate yourself about this stuff because there's a lot of great information on there, and you can improve your your community just by knowing this information and knowing what Lauren and her group is doing. So it's foodispower.org. And now for a section of the program that I love that's on your website because you know being a, as a fellow Texan moved to Virginia, there is not good Mexican food here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you you have a little section on the site, learn about vegan Mexican food. Please tell us about this. <laughs> so as you and I are both good Texans, um, I'm also a Chicana, and so um, I just felt like we needed to have an outlet for different individuals to share their vegan Mexican food recipes because so many times people think – that it's impossible to, you know, be a Chicano or, you know, a Latino and um, enjoy your, your home foods. And so we created this website to show everybody you still can. It's been amusing to have people contact us and ask us if um, we're just a front group trying to get people to go vegan. And what, you know, those type of people don't understand is there's lots of us who are vegans who just want our comfort foods. We want our enchiladas. We want our... Um, we want all of our horchata and everything else we can get, <laughs> but also for people like you, Jason, who just need our down, down home goodness, our um, you know our tamales and other foods that you know. If you grew up in Texas, you grew up with Mexican food, and it's really hard to find it. Um, there's some places in California, but there's not many, and there's yeah. just not really food like down down in Texas. So some of the recipes are from just people all over the place who've donated them to us, and we always welcome recipes. For this website and because we don't have any money to, to hire anybody to be a chef for us we credit everybody on the bottom of their recipe um, to show these are real people who came up with these recipes and um, it's good stuff it is amazing because growing up in Texas there's only two types of food it's one chicken fried steak and the other is Mexican <laughs> food and, <laughs> and I love both I make vegan chicken fried steak all the time with Ooh. cream gravy and mashed potatoes all you know all that the good old stuff. And I am on a mission from God to find a great Mexican food here in Virginia. And I've, I've failed. God hates me at the moment. <laughs> but I love Mexican food. I don't, I don't think it's that. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's so it's deep inside me as well as the Dr. Yep. Pepper. So I, mean, I love that <laughs> we have all these important serious issues and then we have, then we have vegan Mexican vegan food Mexican because, food. because yeah. it is that important it's just you know they're all equal Jason you know we got to give people vegan Mexican food because that's that'll cure all ills it really will throw jalapenos on there get some habaneros your sickness is gone <laughs> <laughs> I love it and I love the food empowerment project I think it's a great idea I think it's a great project and I thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us. Absolutely, and thank this. you. And thank, you know, it's just always refreshing to find people who understand that the interconnectedness of these issues is absolutely important, and that every social justice movement that I knew got strong when they, when they really did branch out 
and um, reach out to other communities. I often talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and when he became most dangerous is when he started talking about the plight of the janitors and he started talking against the war in Vietnam. That's when you become strong and that's when you grow and that's when you're harder to stop. And I think that once we combine all these issues that so many of us care about, um, we'll be a, a true force to be reckoned with. It's true because if you're only talking about one about issue, one. you end up talking to yourself and talking yeah. to the same people over and over again. And we've seen current movements right now that is happening on a large scale. Absolutely. And we have to embrace everyone if we're ever going to change everything. <laughs> so, Thank you. The website is foodispower.org. And, and as part of the anarchist philosophy, if, if people are starving, you don't write a letter to your congressman. The, the idea of direct action is that if people don't have enough food, you take it.